All right, welcome everybody. On today's show, we got Brianna. Uh, she's got an amazing success story with, with uh, one of the symptoms that, or autoimmune diseases that hits home with me is ulcerative colitis, because I had ulcerative colitis for since 2013 to, I would say, four years ago or three years ago. So um, for me, it's really important to share more things that have to do with autoimmune issues. And it was great for me to uh, find Brianna with her story about uh, how she recovered with ulcerative colitis. And I'm sure there's other symptoms um, that we'll tackle. But yeah, right away, thank you for joining. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, being on this, this is really, this is going to help a lot of people, I think, to bring more awareness to uh, not just the mind-body, but, you know, specific things like UC. So, um, yeah, if, you, if you'd like to just uh, give us a gist of, um, you know, a bit of your story about your symptoms, as many as you can remember, because I like talking about symptoms, because uh, I think that if somebody, you know, hears a symptom, then they go, oh, my God, I, I have that. I can recover from that. Oh, my goodness. That's great. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I actually, because I've got a laundry list, I uh, wrote them down. <laughs> awesome. Good. Um, Details. So, I love it. Yeah, and a lot of my stuff, so a lot of, there are some symptoms, like there were anaphylactic reactions that I was having to food and stuff since I was like a child. Um, yep. A lot of uh, allergies, that kind of stuff. And then there was mental health stuff that I had for my whole life that I just thought was a part of being who I was. Um <clears throat> And a ton of that stuff has healed as well. Yeah. Um, so my Perfect. lip. And yeah, I had multiple. By the time I found DNRS, I had multiple autoimmune conditions. I had an autoimmune thyroid condition. I had ulcerative colitis. One doctor who had like colonoscopy wise had said possibly Crohn's. The other one said ulcerative colitis. Um, and, and both doctors said I would need to be on medication and have yearly um colonoscopies for the rest of my life, which I don't, I never took the medication because it was a pretty new medication. And my yeah. dad, doctor was pretty, he kind of said, you know, wait on new medications until they've been out for a while. And actually I think the medication that was recommended to me was pulled later, like two years later. So, oh. so yeah, lucky me. Um, well, you know what, before you go into the, the big list, let's mm -hmm. might as well hit the UC questions. Um, when did you notice that, you know, you're feeling, what were some of the symptoms that you're feeling with the UC and what was the, you know, how did they tackle this? Did you have a colonoscopy and all that? Yeah. So I had a colonoscopy and endoscopy. That was yeah. how I was diagnosed. Um, a lot of things like I had endometriosis as well, polycystic ovary syndrome. I had surgery to diagnose that because back in the day you couldn't diagnose that via ultrasound. It was all surgical. Um, and so, yeah. Every anything that I list, the way that it was diagnosed was like AMA diagnosed. Um, yeah, with ulcerative colitis. I mean, I had the whole gambit. I had also IBS C, so it wasn't like a lot of people with UC have like IBS D, which is different. Um, yeah, I had like when I would go to the bathroom, it would just be blood, you know, just like really bad, <laughs> yeah, um, ulcerative colitis symptoms. Um, and uh, that was kind of why I went in because I was like, obviously this isn't normal. And it was, I mean, it was pretty debilitating. Um, How old are you when you got the I mean, UC? Um, that I was in college, probably like my third year of college. So I was makes like sense. Early twenties, maybe like yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then it started with having problems with the washroom, seeing stuff in the toilet, and pains stuff mm -hmm. like that yeah, ex like extreme pain and the thing is so i have had digestive stuff since i was a kid um right. pretty severe different digestive stuff eventually like when i had that colonoscopy actually that's when the paperwork came back and said um uh, probable celiac um and all that stuff so that i got tested for that later as well right um uh, yeah okay that's great okay so you got that, then you, you did the colonoscopy and the, the other one that goes down your throat. Mm -hmm. And then they, they put you on, did they put you on uh, pills like two times a day type thing or any, any prednisone? Yeah, they tried, or... but I never filled the prescription because it was a new or a drug and I just didn't. Yeah. Okay. My dad, so my dad is, my whole family are medical. They're all doctors. Oh. And my dad um, had already kind of, 
transferred more into like functional medicine stuff and was kind of against medicating symptoms using AMA medicine. And I was still at that point, I was still on a lot of medications. Like I was on a bunch of psych medications. I was on a bunch of medications. At one point I was on like between 11 and 13 medications. Um, yeah. And then at 25, I cold turkey went off of all of my medications. Um, and that was when I started doing like dietary interventions and just a lot of like lifestyle type stuff. I was taking yeah. a lot of like supplements and stuff like that. And then, so that's um, how you managed. Okay. So when you, after you had the colonoscopy and, you, and then they mm -hmm. said, okay, you got, you see what could be Crohn's. How did you, is that what you did to manage the, the UC without having to take the actual medication? Yeah. So I started ish doing lifestyle stuff. Mostly I just kind of lived with it for a while. Um, yeah. And, uh, um, and yeah, and then once I got off of all of my medications was really when I started doing lifestyle stuff before that, yeah. it was just kind of like, I'm just going to live with the symptoms. Um, uh, and I did some of the stuff that they had recommended. And actually even the doctors at that point said like, you need to lower your stress response. Yeah. And then when I was 25, um, after I had gotten off of all my medications, et cetera, when I went, I got all this blood testing done to test for, it was like four to six grand of just blood testing um, wow. to test for allergies and, and all of this stuff. And then they also tested my cortisol levels and they were like, you have the cortisol levels of someone like actively running from a burning building because I was just mm -hmm. so stressed and I'm on the spectrum and like we moved every two years, my whole childhood. So I think I was just kind of set up to just have a lot of stress because mm -hmm. I didn't and I wasn't you know we weren't taught how to necessarily manage that stuff right exactly yeah. okay so uh yeah so you had you managed it uh because I know for me I was put on uh mesavant some people go on on steroids which is mm -hmm. horrible yeah they manage it the that way doctor recommended uh like steroids and immune suppressant drugs um right gonna do that because i mean it just didn't make sense to me like i have an immune system for a reason yeah. i don't want to not have an immune system that yeah it didn't make sense yeah was well, it's it's interesting because i was on the anti-inflammatory uh route where i took two pills every day and it it helped manage it somewhat i was 80 percent okay um my brother he had it five years before me he was put on the uh in, infusions so it's the, I think it's what you're speaking of the immune system suppression, right? So he's been on that for a long time. And it's just interesting how when people, you know, go through UC and they go on the, these medications, they're, they have a lot of fear to get off the medications because yeah. there's fear put into them going, well, if you get off it, you, that might not work again if you want to go on it again, because your, your body might reject it. And then what next? we got to go to a different, right? So there's lots of fear. And also, they, they cost a fortune, some of these drugs. Yeah. So if, you know, you get accepted with a special thing where they, you know, they pay and half or whatever. Life. That's the thing is it's like you're accepted and then you are you are a an active participating um, consumer because that's yeah. what I think, you know, I think that it's a, it is, it's a business. You are a consumer of this product that is, yep. you know, has been marketed to you for life. Like, it's like, okay, yep. you need this to... That was, I mean, I was put on antidepressants when I was like early on 12, 13, I was on SSRIs and I was on SSRIs for like 13 years and I was terrified to go off of them because yeah. of the suicidal ideation stuff that I really struggled with. But the thing is I was struggling with that while I was on it anyway. And mm. once I, you know, found a brain retraining was really like, that is what changed that for me. Like I can yeah. now, before that it was like lifestyle still helped with that somewhat um because i think you know like in dnrs they teach like truth truth one and truth two like yes there are some things that are healthier for you um mm -hmm. or there are some things that are you know not great for the body and your body is responding to those things in a way that's not normal um right. so it's like, i'm still i think that the the game is always like learning to balance like okay what decisions do i make out of from a place of love for myself and then also like where do I need to retrain? Um, right. And I want to retrain so that I could make any decision I wanted to when I do want to do that and yeah. then choose how I live my life 
from a place right. of love and not fear. Right. So go, well, I don't want to do that not because I, I have to not do that because I don't want to do that. Yeah. Right. You want to have that choice, not because we're forced to have that choice. Uh, so, okay. So you're, uh, were there times where you're, when you were managing it with before the brain retraining that you had some flares come up here and there? Oh, yeah. yeah. Really bad flares, especially. So if I would eat gluten, um, if I ever got into dairy, like I had a lot of things that I could not eat. Um, right. Yeah. And, and also like if any time I would get very stressed, which was pretty frequently, I was diagnosed like at one point, one doctor diagnosed me type two rapid cycling bipolar. I had like very intense emotional swings. Um, and actually, do you want to, should I read my symptom list so that? You well, can yeah, well now I was going to say, now let's finish off and start going through your symptom list while we're at it. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, um, multiple chemical sensitivity. Chronic yep. fatigue syndrome, chronic pain, Ehlers Danlos syndrome, celiac, mm -hmm. many, many food allergies. By the time I found DNRS, I was eating three fruits, and I had only been eating those three fruits for like almost a year and a half. Um, I was down, like my, I was so, so skinny. <laughs> I looked like I was dying. So um, those were your safe foods, just the three fruits. Yeah, it was three fruits. Which yeah. ones were they? Do you, which uh, ones I was, were like watermelon? Yeah. Um, lemon and oranges which i was still reacting to those because i also had um mast cell activation syndrome so the histamine and the right. citrus but they were the right. least it was for me like my body wouldn't physically digest anything else it's like it couldn't like i couldn't digest things um, it's interesting yeah. how the how the brain chooses from different people different uh things where they it cuts it off for me if i had citrus i was fucked for at least a week Right. Yeah. And meat, I could eat beef. And like with some people, generally speaking, people couldn't have the, the citrus or the histamines or the blah, blah, blah. But some people could have those things that for us were like lava. You can't yeah. eat that or, you, you know. Well, right? and for me, like for a long time, I was no histamine. Like I did GAPS diet for years where I was like high animal fat and like a lot of animal protein and stuff. And then I developed, I tried carnivore for um, yeah. a brief time because I developed really severe gout. I developed type two diabetes, mm -hmm. um, which was partially stress and then, you know, partially yep. just the sheer amount of fat in my diet. Um, mm -hmm. And, and yeah, so I kind of, I went plant-based in order to reverse the gout and the type two diabetes. And then, so I think my body, when it like broke down into, okay, you can only have these foods. It was like, well, these are the yeah. options. So, and I was still having like, I had like dyshydrotic eczema and these huge like histamine flares. So I know that even yeah. my safe foods weren't safe. I don't know that there were any safe foods really. Um, right. but I had to eat something. Yeah. That um, makes sense. When some people, when they, when I, when they say when I say safe foods, people think that oh, so you mean when you just ate those safe foods, that means all your seventy five symptoms went away? I'm like, no, I no, still had the seventy five no, symptoms. Survive the day. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's what it. That's what it means. Right. Yeah. Because if you went off those safe foods, you're you're not surviving the day in a way. Right. You're yeah. you're you're fucked in another way. <laughs> to put yeah, it. absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah. Continue with with the the list if you want. Go ahead. So yeah, tons of food sensitivities, um, environmental allergies, like for years I slept outside of, or for like over a year, I slept outside mm -hmm. of my apartment in my car because I was reacting to the carpet in my apartment. Um, yeah. So that mast cell activation syndrome, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. I had electric hypersensitivity syndrome, pretty severe on that one. Um, CPTSD, extreme depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, panic disorder, frequent panic attacks, which I had had that since I was a child. Right. Um, OCD, also pure O with just like the thoughts, which I think that's just limbic system imbalance, really. Looping, the um, looping thoughts, right? Constant yeah. looping? Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, IBSC, ulcerative colitis, asthma, endometriosis, polycystic ovary syndrome. I had premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is also known as PMDD with severe suicidal ideation, which is like extreme PMS, but to the point where it takes over your whole life. Like I would just burn my life down yep. in my hormones. Cause my body thought my hormones, my own hormones were a danger. <laughs> yep. um, 
Yeah, I also had homozygous MTHFR gene mutations. So I had two copies of the C677T um, mutation, which, yeah. yeah. Um, I, call it, I call it the motherfucker gene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, which that's reversed. Like you can reverse that. And I didn't even, yeah. that's, you, can, you know, change. It's, it's just epigenetics. So yeah. But yeah, rapid cycling, bipolar 2, type 2 diabetes, blood sugar issues, adrenal fatigue, sensory sensitivities, Raynaud's syndrome. Oh, um, the Raynaud's, the good old oh, Raynaud's. Yeah. Oh, yes. Love yeah. that. And that one came later, like, like three years after I was like deep in the perfect storm of my yep. last perfect storm. Cause I realized there were various perfect storms throughout my life. Yeah. Um, usually there are, I noticed that, I noticed that pattern. People usually have more than one until yeah. they find out what it really is. It's like, they almost needed another shakeup to really wake up and go, no, this is the answer. So sometimes yeah. we need it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. And then eating disorder things. So like bulimia, anorexia, eventually orthorexia, just because, you know, my body is reacting to all these foods. Yep. Um, and then also addiction stuff. Cause I realized like I had given up alcohol at when I was 25. Um, and, mm -hmm. Um, realized like later on now in life that I was really just using that to mask just the extreme. I just wanted to check out of my life right. because it was too intensely uncomfortable to just exist. As what about weed? Smoking weed. Did that help also? Yeah. Some people go down there. Oh yeah, I did. I smoked weed as well. Um, CBD, CBD oil. Um, yeah, I did some CBD. Mostly I was a big smoker for a while after I was sober oh. off of the alcohol because I was still just trying to manage. It's like yeah. it's like you can get sober off of a substance, but until you like create a life that you want to live in and, and a self that you want to live in and a body that you want to live in, it's it's really hard to to yeah. not find something to try to mask that. And it can be sugar, it can be food, it can be relationships, it can be whatever. Oh. Yeah, we'll, we'll hit that too. Relationships. Were you, a yeah. couple more quick questions. Were you a cigarette smoker at all? No, like briefly okay. when I was drinking, but not really. Because yeah, they go like peas and carrots, alcohol mm -hmm. and cigarettes. Uh, what else was there? Ah, I forgot. It'll come back to me. Uh, was that any, anything left on the, the list? No, that was most of it. There's, I mean, there, there I'm are. I'm sure there's more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any uh, take a cardio where the heart rate stayed over a certain amount with heart racing all the time? Um, I don't think I had tachycardia and I didn't really ever have pops. Um, right. uh, yeah, I did. I did have like I had heart murmur stuff even when I was a kid off yeah. and on. But I don't know. Like I, it wasn't noticeable enough that we did anything about it that I ever, you know, was concerned about it or was like necessarily diagnosed with anything. Okay. I guess now we'll move it to how do you think throughout your life? Because I, I think that, you know, we get these things not from thin air or because we're, you know, just because there's always a reason, right? Mm -hmm. And I like to go back a little bit and just give me the gist of throughout your life of things that, that might have added to, to fill up your, your bucket mm -hmm. or your, to bring your baseline to a, to a thousand. And we'll, I guess with childhood, did you just have anything, uh, some, events or traumas throughout childhood that started this? Um, yeah. So, um, childhood, I was very, um, I was already like, I was, so I was on the spectrum already yeah. limbic. I, no one even thought about me being on the spectrum until I was like 33 and, and figured it out myself and then went to go talk to somebody about it, you know? Um, yeah. And that was just because I think awareness of what it looks like in women um, and it's like high functioning, which, you know, what yeah. used to be called Asperger's, but is no longer called that. Um, but like how that affects the system. And then my dad was in the military. Um, and so we were moving every two years, like overseas, just wherever. Right. Um, and that was very traumatic for me. Right. Um, did you have a good relationship with your mom and your father? And did they have a good relationship together? I would say um, they had somewhat, you know, they they're very, very different. My mom is very emotional. My dad is hyper rational. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think that there was contention there. Um, and my mom is actually too. She when I started doing DNRS, she started doing DNRS with me and nice. she was very limbic just growing up. And, but, you know, we, you just don't know. Um, right. And then yeah. once you do know, you see how many people around you everywhere you go. Yeah, literally you know, you see, everyone. 
It's like you can see their buckets are full. Like, oh, I can see, I can see your bucket. I can see how full you are. Yeah. Oh, yeah, buddy. And then they go, I'm not like you. This is different. No, this is normal. Oh my God, I'm not right. And they treat you yeah, like or, you're you're or the special think, one. Yeah, I think too. Like so much of it, I think that people can get almost like they integrate their issues into who they are and so it's really yeah. hard to dismantle that until it's like rock bottom you know for me it was like dnrs was my last resort i had spent yeah. literally uh, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars on trying yep. to just get to where i could live like other people were living um yeah so plus all the research uh, Pardon. All the exhaustion, plus all the researching, trying this, yeah. functional this, try yeah. that, supplement. Thousands of hours of research, yeah. Oh, Facebook groups. Um, Were you ever in 50 Facebook groups at all? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, yeah, with childhood, there was kind of all that stuff. And then we, yeah. we had this. And, yeah, so I didn't really, I feel, I didn't get a lot of education on how to emotionally process because neither of my parents knew. You know, yeah. and that's not a them issue. I think that there's so much more information now, too. Um, but yeah, so then it was like eighth grade. Um, we moved from Washington State to Florida. My best friend was up here. I really didn't. It was like, I guess, halfway through seventh grade. And right when we so when we moved, it was extremely stressful. I did not want to move there. I um had basically extreme anxiety um with that and then i ended up developing shingles which when we went in my dad told the doctors he was like she has shingles and they were like no she doesn't no one this young has she right no one this young with shingles and then they were like oh yeah this is shingles so that was like a was like a viral hit to the system i went through puberty at the same time roughly um mm. and that because of the PMDD and, and all of that stuff and how my body limbically responded to my own hormones, that was a lot. Um, and then also it was just emotionally a lot for me to, to move. Um, yeah. And, and the symptoms become your, your trauma. Yeah. Also being scared of just having anxiety, right? Being yeah, scared and, within. Yeah. That makes yeah. Sense. And, and kind of from that, point on I mean honestly since from when I my first panic attack that I remember was in second grade I remember just laying in my bed thinking I was dying and didn't know that I wasn't gonna die you know I didn't even know what that was I didn't actually know what that was until I was put in therapy when I was you know um like a young teenager um because of the suicidal ideation stuff um and that was when I first was medicated and then I was medicated for the endometriosis, like I was taking painkillers for a lot of years, um, just a lot of different medications. Um, yeah, so I can kind of hear myself echoing. Is that okay? It's it, it, as long as it's not okay bugging you too much. No, it doesn't bother me. I just okay. want to make sure that okay, perfect. Okay. Um. So yeah, I I after that I was in high school, and then it was like. I mean, I was just doing anything to try to cope. Um, and I, I mean, I had issues with like self mutilation and, um, just a lot of mental health stuff. Um, I was diagnosed very high, um, milligrams of, uh, SSRIs. And then I was dealing with like depersonalization and derealization where I didn't even feel like I was in my own body and just a lot of a lot of stuff there. Um, but I was, you know, I, I basically thought that I would never get off of antidepressants for my whole life. Cause I was scared to, um, yeah. And then, and yeah. And then, and I was consistently like often around the PMDD times, I would just do stuff that would just blow up my life where it was like, and I'm expelled from school or, you know, whatever. Like I would just make really poor decisions. And then once I found alcohol, which was like 18, 19, like I just used that as my main coping mechanism. So I was just, you know, kind of trash in my life. Um, yeah, with me, it was also the people I was around. We were all listening to music. I was in a band. Uh, you know, usually it's the, the, your environment, the people, your friends, right? And then they drink and then we all drink and then we drink every day. And it yeah, was I would say that, central. but I was also always like I drank everyone under the table and yeah. I everyone I was the person that everyone would look at and say well we're not 
that bad. So mm. it's okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then at 21, I got a, I got a DUI. Um, and, and I mean, I, yeah, I was like, I blew a 0.47. I think I was playing whiskey pong and then I drove someone wow. home. Like, and I was coherent. The, the cops were, they didn't think that I could be blowing what I was blowing, you know, right. so they retested me at the station because they were like, there's no way that you're just talking to us. Well, you built like a level of resilience with all the drinking and that puts a lot of stress on the body with, with, you mm -hmm. know, well, and also alcohol. With, yeah. With the, with the MTHFR gene mutation too, um, which is very common with autism. Um, like I wasn't doing the second level of detox. So all that alcohol after, you know, it was changed into this more toxic substance was just hitting my bloodstream. So it was, mm -hmm. I think, you know, it, yeah. Um, but yeah, so at 25, I actually, I went to this place out in Iowa, um, rehab that basically they kind of taught, they taught a lot of DBT skills. They taught you how to live. They didn't put me on a bunch of medications because where I'd been before that, they would just hyper medicate me. And then I would just be like nodding, not like I wasn't even there as a person. Wow. Um, yeah. and so that place, yeah, they taught me how to like, how to sleep and how to exercise, how to volunteer and all this stuff. And so I was able to get sober and they took me off all of my medications. And I was on like wow. IV bags of vitamins and stuff like for the, for while I was there in, and that play, like if, if I had known before going that they were going to take me off my antidepressants, I never would have gone. Cause right. I would, I would have, I just never would have gone. I didn't think that that was something that I would ever be able to do. Cause there was so much fear involved in yeah, coming so off that stuff. Fear. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then, but because like I learned how to exercise and how to eat and all these, all these things, um, I was able to build a life for myself where, you know, it was semi manageable without the alcohol. But like I said, I still, like I smoked a lot of weed and stuff just mm -hmm. to still like help with the, the, the anxiety, which is just limbic system yep. imbalance. Yeah. Yeah. So then, uh, what was, how did you discover brain retraining? How did you get to that? Um, okay. So I, yeah, I think it was like 2014. I moved into this, an apartment in Seattle that had black mold. Um, and I lived there for like three years. And that was when my body was like, no, everything broke. Um, and it was really cool. Actually, it was my dad because I was saying I thought it was my hormones or something because my I mean, it was so bad. Um, yep. And my dad, I went to their visit them and then I didn't have a lot of the symptoms that I've been having um, just while I was visiting. And he was like, that sounds like black mold. And so I went back when I came back to the apartment, I like looked behind cause I had these blackout curtains and I was dating someone at the time who took hot showers before that. I always took cold showers and oh. there was just like water running down the window into the, into the frame. And, but, but I mean, the building had been sick before, you know, right. ever moved in with me, but, but yeah, so, you know, I moved out of there and then it was like all of the trying, trying all of the things, you know, that, and doing all the research and all that crazy stuff. All for, the detoxes and shit. Yeah, for years. And then also I was in a in a relationship with somebody who um diagnosably has um a personality disorder. And it was, mm. it was that was very, very extreme stress for me. And I didn't even know until like a year after he and I broke up. And I, it, I was like deep into DNRS already. And, yep. and, and then I kind of learned about, you know, what that actually was and that that was an abusive situation and all that. Um, so, but yeah, so then eventually I moved out, I moved in with my parents um, yep. because they had the cleanest house of anyone. Like they had all wood floors. I knew I wouldn't be reacting to the carpet, et cetera. And I thought I just needed to like physically detox, um, but I, I was ready to just take myself off the planet because I couldn't, like, I just I didn't have a life, you know? It was, yeah. then I was reacting to stuff in my parents' house. And mm. yeah, I kind of, I had like this moment. It was, it's pretty crazy, actually. I, I drove till it was like this cliff face and I was basically just like begging the universe or God or whatever to help me. Yeah. Um, I heard a voice in my head that said MCAS, which I didn't know about mast cell activation syndrome. Um, I hadn't been, 
I, I didn't know that that was part of what I was dealing with. Um, and when I went home, I looked that up because I had just yep. heard it. And, and the first page that I came across, one of the things they recommended was DNRS. And so um, I got the book and I read Did you see the success stories? Uh, the uh, YouTube success stories from DNS. Yeah, so, yeah, a lot of what it was, it was actually, it was on their website. There was this one lady, she was, she was the lady with like, she would get like lesions on her tongue or whatever, but yep. she was talking about like the mold and, you know, and I was like, oh my God, you know, and it, I had done so many things before this that I had had hope for and then just been, you know, like it would help for a little while or it really wouldn't help or whatever that. I was very skeptical, um, yeah. but it was kind of like last resort. And then once I was watching the videos and when I watched the videos, like this is crazy to even think about. Um, when I watched the videos, it was at my parents' house. I had to sit outside of their door yep. in, in, out so that I could hear the videos, but I couldn't really see it because I was so electronically sensitive. Um, yeah, I heard people do that before. They would have to do it in the next room because the yeah, EMF was, sensitive, yeah. yeah pretty crazy um and yeah so how did you feel what was that after you saw more success stories on dnrs did that give you like uh, maybe a rebirth of hope that hope, okay i'm gonna do this i would say the biggest thing for me was because i'd been in this relationship with somebody that was telling me like it's not real which in a way is true but also like the way that it was done was like I I questioned mm -hmm. I was questioning my own ability to know what was real or what wasn't real because of gaslighting yeah. and all this stuff. Like I I was pretty a pretty broken individual. And Annie, there was this one part in the in the videos where she said, like, it's not your fault. You didn't create this, which was the opposite of what I had been told over and over and over. Like it's not just in your head, like like something happened in in physicality that created yeah. this in you, but you can solve it. Um, I feel like that was really where the moment for me, I was just like weeping, first of all, because I just needed yeah. to hear that. Um, and then I started like within two weeks of starting DNRS, I did living DNRS classes with Connie yep. specifically. I was in her classes for like a whole year yep. um, and in there too, just hearing other people, you know, yep. and at that point I had like debilitating social anxiety. Like I, I, yeah, it was like heart palpitations when I would mm -hmm. just be talking to people. I, you know, I had trouble going into stores. Like it was, yep. yeah. It's Phobias crazy. all of a sudden, all of a sudden you're afraid of things you've never been afraid of before. I had that too. <laughs> Random phobias. So then you stuck with it. Um, mm -hmm. How, how long were you doing DNRS until what was next after that? Did you just stay on DNRS? So, I mean, honestly, so I still, I always kind of, I kind of took DNRS and made it my own in a way. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of stuff. So like when I would post on the forum, anything about suicide, it would get edited out, which yeah. I understand because that can be a triggering thing. But also it was the first thing that I searched for on the forum and yeah. And I just thought no one dealt with that. So I don't know if maybe other people did too. And that stuff got edited out because it would just be nice to know, you know, that was something that I did was like, because I had that looping thing for researching symptoms. Right. Whenever, it could help other people. That, yeah. Yeah. Whenever I would do want to do that, I would go on the forum and I would just research the symptom there and be like, okay, this person healed this, this person just keep mm. reminding myself. Um, but also like I I did I've done a lot of things pretty differently in terms of rounds and just how I I did things. I think it was kind of almost an approach to really treat the emotional, mental health side of things. I didn't really train on foods physically or whatever. I I, I did mostly a lot of emotional work and then that stuff just kind of resolved one by one. Like I didn't really yeah. focus on the physical stuff as much because I knew for me that the emotional stuff under underlies things. And interestingly, so Connie has now kind of gone off on her own and she has re recovering together classes that it's like living DNRS kind of. Um, but she does a lot more work with emotions and also stuff with like bottom up practices with somatics and just I don't know, I just feel like it's it's really comprehensive in some ways. And I still do her classes off yep. and on um just because it's helpful and i'm still working through layers of like relational things and stuff even yep. though i have full food freedom like i'm physically healthy 
Um, and I right. Think so that's the next question. Yeah. Out of all those symptoms, uh, are most of them settled? Are most of them gone? Like the UC? Oh, yeah. Oh, everything. Yeah. Every Yeah, all of my physical stuff is gone. Occasionally, if I do something like kind of high stress, like yep. I was just a Burning Man this year, right, which I never thought I would be able to do Burning Man again. But it's a it's a pretty intense environment. Um, and after that, I, I noticed like a few like physical symptoms kick up slightly, but it was like very minor. And then it passes as long as I am doing the work. Um, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of what I use DNRS for now is like as a manifestorial practice to have the life that I want. Like it has to do yeah. with like, and a lot of what I do as well is like, I rewrite my past in order. And I kind of have done this the whole time. That's something that that's pretty outside of DNRS guidelines, but I, I did a lot of rewriting past memories. Um, mm -hmm. So I created different parents. I created um, a different version of self that just had this information from a really young age. And I, I just, it's like your brain will think that those are your real memories if you. Yeah. So you still, you still do, do the visuals every day. Yeah. So I still, yeah. Cause I mean, like if you listen to anyone like Neville Goddard or anyone who talks like manifestation, like the visualizations, yep. it's where it's at to create the person that you want to be and create the life that you want to live. And so I feel like it's, we we're given the keys to the kingdom. People can get really focused on like the physical aspects of that, but it's also like, it's so much bigger than that. So you can use it's in, it. It's interesting. Right you're like, later. you're like the 10th person with these interviews. Cause I've, I've came, came to the same conclusion as you, everything that I did to learn to heal my physical self, the same methods, I use to create my reality when it comes to also mm -hmm. relationships, businesses, uh, situations I don't prefer in life. I, I, I've learned, it's like a universal law that I've learned because of the visuals, because I got the downloads, I, I was tapping into consciousness. Mm -hmm. And you, you you learn the law. It's like a special law, like we're in a special club, like the secret club, like we learn the secret, right, in a way. And then we, I use them exactly the way I, I, I recovered with everyday life and it works. It's interesting yeah. how it works. Yeah. And people talk about like, oh, well, I want to get to the point where I don't have to do rounds. And I'm like, why would you not want to do rounds? Like you're creating yourself. You're, you're, you know, you're taking, you're taking the power into your own hands and deciding who you are because literally anything is possible. Anything yeah. is possible. It's just your brain has been trained by society, by whatever to believe something else. So it's like, why wouldn't I use this? to yep. do anything. And I think a lot of people, it's like they'll heal their physical body and then they think that that's, you know, and then that's Done. what it is yeah. basically. And then right. they'll have another hit to the system. Like they'll get a virus or they'll have a, a breakup or whatever. And then they develop physical symptoms again. It's like, yeah, cause it's, there's so many more layers to the onion of, uh, you know, and once you work through that stuff and it, I think it's like a, you know, our journey never ends, right? It's like a lifelong beautiful practice that you can have it's a lifestyle yeah some people like to do yoga for you know some people play hockey some people go to church this mm -hmm. was my this is my religion right and i don't i don't think of it as a program that i'm doing i think about it as something i can't wait to fucking go do my visuals every day i haven't Thank missed you. a day in four, four and a half good. years and yeah. it's power because like i i mean i for so much of my life was just so reactive to things in my environment, you know, emotionally. And I yeah. would say and do things that were so outside of who I am as a person that were extremely hurtful, especially in relationships. Like I was abusive in relationships when I was in high school and in different mm -hmm. times, you know, and I understand too, like, like, you know, my, my ex, he's not doing that on purpose. Like he just right. has ingrained patterns based on yeah. from things that happened when he was a little kid, you know, that, that created this it's not i'm it, there's no reason to ever be angry at anyone for anything um but it's, it's like an awakening you, yeah, you, you go awake. through an awakening yeah, yeah. And, and i feel like you know the the power to react to things as who i am in integrity with who i am as a person and and how i love and you know that it's the power to do that that's magic you know and to just then you can, you know, it's so much easier to love yourself and also to give everyone else grace because you're like, hey, man, you're just limbic. So if you're being mean to me, it has nothing to do with me. You know, it's right. just, 
you know, you're just hurting and, and yeah. And it can be tough because it's like, you see it everywhere. Like my dad, now he recommends DNRS to like 95% of his patients that come through. Right. That's awesome. Because he's like, this has, you know, this has a basis. Proof is in the pudding. This. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's like, yeah, you'll meet a lot of people. I feel like throughout life that are, that will just tell you the laundry list of their stuff. And you're like, Oh, I had all of that and you can cure it. But it's like, people they're either ready to hear it or they're not so yeah they think it's woo woo wishy-washy oh, yeah. they're they're like oh, that's that, that sounds like hippie shit. okay yeah okay no this is real this is real though now that's even people around me in my family that have seen me recover mm -hmm. they're still on the fence about it they're like no 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 but this is real though i'm like yeah i had ulcerative colitis what about that it's gone yeah and then it could get to the point where they're like i don't know if you really had ulcerative colitis yeah, I don't know. yeah exactly mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's also like, once again, like, it's like anything where people's belief structures, it, they integrate them to the point of themselves where it's part of who they are. And unless I think yeah. like you hit something that like forces you to change That's that, it. like, why would you want, it feels like an abandonment of self to let go of, of the belief structure. And we've been programmed by society yes. about, you know, yeah. Like, like the, there are so many industries that make a lot of money out of us believing that we don't have power. And that's, it's the medical industry. It's the, yeah. it's pharmaceutical. the pharmaceutical industry. It's also like makeup and uh, what you, just all the ways that, you know, you're told that you're, you're not good enough and you should do, you should buy something to be good enough um, or to get good enough. And so, yeah, I think it's a lot of unraveling, like, core belief structures that, you know, just by the nature of being human, we're kind of impregnated with that. Well, yeah, that's why I think it's a gift because um, if I didn't think is the only way I would have recovered is for me to fall on my face really, really hard and have the 75 symptoms and be, you know, bedridden. Because if I didn't, I would have just managed and kept managing and go, yeah, well, I'll do it. If, if somebody gave, gave me the key and went, Right. Here's the answer. I would have been like, oh, I'll start next year. But yeah. I got the answer by having, you know, the whole destruction of my life happen. And that's how the answer was given to me. And I took it and I made sure to be disciplined every day because yeah. the fear was driving me. It was keeping me on track. So yeah. it was a gift for me. And I'm fucking grateful because that's now. The thing. Yeah, yeah. Best thing that's ever happened to me. And like my. My whole life because of the like the mental health stuff like the i was so very sensitive to a lot of stuff that was in foods and stuff like it a lot of things were deeply impacting my mental health and i had problems with suicidal ideation from when i was 11. i mean before that even like yeah. that was like my brain's kind of like self-soothing thing and then i tried you know to take myself off the planet multiple times in ways that then really, I mean, also probably further the LSI because it was like wrecking yeah. my car into a tree at 90 miles an hour. You know, it's like things that are very stressful for the body um, yeah. and the mind. Um, but yeah, it's it's like all of those things, like when, yeah, all those things, I wouldn't, I don't think I would go back and change anything. No. And and crazy. for me, but. when you said uh, earlier, um, when, we, when we were talking about how oh, this is a lifestyle, for me, it's necessary for this to be a lifestyle because life is going to, I think you mentioned this, life is going to keep throwing you curveballs, yeah. right? So why not have it where, you know, instead of it being full, my bucket's, you know, here so that it can handle the, the curveballs compared to people, like a lot of people I've know I've seen through this journey, uh, they, they do the work until the symptoms are gone and then they stop, yeah. right? And then they're right underneath the, the the ice, but underneath the ice, underneath the threshold. And as soon as you know they get a little curveball, maybe somebody passes. Well, big curveball. Somebody passes away, or your dog dies, or blah 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 blah. You have a whatever it is. All of a sudden, they're on top of that threshold again. They're on top of the ice, and then they're they're cracking through it. And then they got to do programs again. They got to start all over again. All the bullshit. For me, I'd rather be do the work once, all the way through, and then maintain it with a lifestyle. 
Yeah. And I feel like too, like it's a, it is, it's an avenue into like so much more spiritual connection, spiritual growth, connection to yourself, connection to your higher self, like connection to who you actually are and not who you've been told you are, you know, it's like, yep. yeah. You, you discover yourself, you just start to, well, it's another awakening, another layer of awakening, yeah. right? With your higher self. And then with the visuals, I still get downloads when I need them. When I have a question, mm -hmm. synchronicities, downloads, like this interview alone, a lot of synchronicities. Oh yeah. Right? It's yeah. shocking. Like if you see some of my other interviews, you'll, you'll see, oh my goodness, that's, I think like you can finish each other's sentences most of the time, right? And I don't because I don't, I don't want to cut you off, right? I've been wanting oh, yeah. to, I'm like, yeah, it, right? I want to do that, but I, but it's crazy. When you when you discover the the truth, the, the awakening, you come across the same answers. That's when you know, check mark, wow, we're on to something. This is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. I got I got one more question for you. If you were to go uh, back in time, and when you started to brain retraining, what advice would you give yourself? Let's say you know your guides were like, okay, you can give yourself a phone call or a Zoom call, and then you see yourself like, oh my god, okay, and then uh, <laughs> and then you're like, okay, you're gonna go through this journey. Here's some advice. What would you say? I feel like, I mean, weirdly, I wouldn't mm -hmm. give myself any advice because it was all perfect. Like it was all fucking perfect, you know. Like yeah. I, it's like. And, and like my past self wouldn't have listened to me anyway because like I was yeah. drowning in my <laughs> own, like I was so attached to like my own pain, like my own agony of existence that, um, you know, I, I don't know that I really could have heard myself even. Um, but I also weirdly have had times and rounds where it's almost like time folds in on itself. And I realize that I helped myself in the past from now. Yeah. It's crazy to me. Like, yeah, um, that, yeah, that blows my mind, you know, because like well, the, thing, the one thing you could say to yourself in the past is like, thank you for that. You were doing the work because now I can live the life that I want. So yeah. Right. Keep going. And then I would say, I don't want to tell you too much because I don't want to, I don't want to fucking cock block your, you know, I need you to fall a couple times. I need you to make the yeah. mistakes. So I don't want to stop that. Yeah. I feel like the main thing that I would just say to my past self is like, you are so loved because I was still listening to all of those voices in my head that told me that everyone would be better off if I wasn't here. And that's a lie. Yeah. It was a lie, you know? And I, I just, I, I couldn't, I didn't know that I couldn't hear that. Um, yeah. And I am here for a reason, just like everyone is like this perfect little fractal of consciousness and we need us all, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think maybe just, I would give myself a giant hug and say, you are so loved and you are so worthy. And, and the ways that you act that then you hate yourself for, you know, where you're like, why am I even doing that? It's not, that's not you. You know, yeah. that's just the old programming. That's just the programming. Yeah. Do you do you have any, uh, are you doing any coaching or anything like that? Um, actually, I am just about to start coaching. So I had an interview a while ago with Connie, more about like Ehlers Danlos, but also about a lot of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And since then, a ton of people have reached out to me because I talked about things that, like I said, aren't really like people are either aren't allowed to talk about in DNRS or whatever. Mm, yeah. um, and so um, I've had, I had a ton of people reaching out to me. Um, yeah. And so I was kind of coaching people for free because <laughs> I yeah. do like, I just want to help people. Um, but also like it was a, it's a big pull on my time and, and, and uh, it's not sustainable to be doing that without um, kind of having compensation yeah. for that, I guess. And so I, I, contacted Connie to kind of ask like, you know, should, would it be a good idea for me to coach or whatever? And she said that she had had a lot of people who were working with her that had kind of, that were stuck that talked to me and then found movement. And so she good. said that she was surprised it took me that long to talk to her. So um, yeah, I'm actually in the process of kind of figuring out how yeah. I'm going to go about coaching. Um, yeah. Well, and when you do, when you figure it all out, email me your all the links and because i'm gonna when i post this i want people to be able to reach you so even your email you can give that to me whenever 
or whatever you want to give me, and I'll put it in the description so people can get, get a hold of you. And while you update, right, I can update too. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah, I'm working on like website stuff and stuff like that, but I could absolutely give you my my email. And I've been meaning to, I was waiting until after Burning Man because I knew that's just such a big oh, yeah. of my time and energy and stuff. Um, so I was waiting until after that to like really start doing coaching and i especially would love to work with people who are struggling with like the mental health aspects of things because mm -hmm. i had the like i had the entire gamut i feel like and eventually yep. i want to kind of um build something that's more geared toward the mental health aspects um and so as much information as i can get from as many people through working mm -hmm. with people i i would just love to to be yeah. able to do that. Mm -hmm. That's uh, I think that was the big missing. That's this is the reason why I left DNRS because that was a missing piece for me. I was healing physically, but the more I healed physically, the more my mental alarm is skyrocketed. And then, so I had to leave because with uh, DNRS, there was a lot of stop, 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 uh, distract, mm -hmm. avoid. And I, I couldn't thing, do that. Which is, it's, that's so good. I feel like at the beginning, um, just to like give yourself the the opportunity to not be stuck in the ways that you were coping or like researching and all that stuff but that's yeah. where like so i talk about connie has those recovering together classes she does so much more work in like the emotional yes. bits of things and it's such a good um like space i feel like to to work on recovering when you've gone further um and yeah. i don't know because i never did the gupta program but i know that that is kind of more based on like ifs which is like internal family system so maybe you know that's a little bit more mental health related um mm -hmm. but i think i think that a lot of things that the medical i know that a lot of things that the medical system say are part of who you are like personality disorders all all these yeah. kinds of things they are rewirable. It's just a really old pathway. I would say 99%. I'm going to, yeah. but I'm not too specific because sometimes people, you know, it's uh, some of the words I don't, like some things I don't bring up yet, but yeah. I think I would say 99% of the things out there, you can fully recover from using yeah, mind body the, tools. Yeah. yeah. It's the future for chronic illness in both mental health and physical yeah. health. Um, and I think that it's slowly gaining traction. So many more people I feel like are coming into DNRS where their doctor's first line of defense was to say, hey, this is something that you should try because the doctors have seen it work for other people. Because doctors, like the large majority of doctors, they're yeah. healers. It's just that, you know, like I said, my whole family, right, is in medicine. My brother, when he graduated from medical school, he, you know, said there's, it's almost like brainwashing part of it, yeah. you know? Um, and it's, they get a two years of pharma and less than a week of nutrition. They get nothing mm -hmm. about like yeah. the connection between everything. And, and so I think that it's, I think that AMA medicine is so useful for like, I got hit by a car or I need surgery on something. Emergencies. Really yeah. Bad or whatever. But for chronic illness, it, it's not, it's not a sustainable system to like right. give yourself things that actually give you more symptoms that then you have to treat with other things. Like it's this whole thing and it's a yeah. brilliant business model. It is a brilliant. Oh, perfect. It works model. good for them. Yeah, yeah. It is a great business, but as consumers, I think well, it's really well, we're waking up to like, imagine, you know, a consumer, this is, I've said this before, are they going to believe, you know, if, are they going to believe me doing videos, you know, talking about this shit, with my dogs in a in a van, and I look like a, a hobo or guy, a guy next door. Are you gonna believe the guy that makes five hundred thousand dollars? He's got the glasses and the white lab coat, and is showing you these confusing uh, things on the, the you know the yeah. the whiteboard. And, and just know, like the doctors, they're doing the best that they can. You know, like my my dad got into functional medicine because he was like, I'm not healing anyone. Yeah. Like this isn't this doesn't work. And he takes a lot of people, like you know, gets rid of. Um, can take a lot of, of of illnesses off of their illness list just by lifestyle and supplementation and stuff alone. Um, but then like once he understood the brain aspect of it, he's that's why I said like he recommends this to almost all of his patients because yeah. it's such a massive aspect of everything. And so I think most doctors like once they know they'll they'll move in this direction, but they've been trained to think mm. a certain way and it's really hard sometimes i think to overcome 
that kind of some some embrace it hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. for this education that taught me that this is the right. way that you treat this but like pharmaceutical medicine we really haven't been doing that other than for like severe illness or whatever sit, until like the 60s you know it's a it's a very new form of and it's and it's just it's a business so yeah some doctors they they embrace it most of them that i've seen hmm, right they're like my when i went to my gastro and because it was like i haven't been on it was like i'm not on the meds anymore and he's like so how are you feeling I'm like pretty good I'm like do you want to know how i did it and he, he didn't say anything he was eating a sandwich scrolling through you know the computer's like all right so uh right doing this and he wasn't even listening to me he didn't care right and meanwhile yeah. meanwhile it's like a couple of years before that i'm like can you put me on the trial to do uh to, to do a fecal transplant because i want to do fecal transplant bullshit. Yeah, Thank yeah, I fuck, I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Shit. Okay, well, thank you for being here. This was an amazing uh, interview. Thank you for sharing your your experience. And I see so many synchronicities. And your story with UC and all the other symptoms. Actually, that's another qu a question I want to ask. Could you please send me all the symptoms in a list right. so I can put it in the description? Because that's going to help a lot of people. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of stuff. I think there are so many things. I mean... CPTSD, which is that complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which is just an accumulation. It's not like there's one thing that caused your post-traumatic stress, but mm -hmm. it's like that I feel like is the underlying thing of so much of everything. And it's like, there are so many things I feel like, especially in the mental health realm that, that people don't link to this. And for me, I was, I was only, I only came into this trying to like exist physically in yeah. on the planet like right. i couldn't physically exist on the planet and that's all i was trying to do but it's like as you if you do the work and then you find the deeper underlying things um every like so like everything is curable and you have yeah. the power yeah and this is it this is the this is the way right yeah. that's so that this is our mission this is our what we've been here to do to yeah to bring oh, to bring absolutely. awareness bring so much awareness and to change people's lives yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank for you. Reaching out to me and thank you for having this podcast. I think it's, it's so important for people to just be able to hear. That was a big thing that I did while I was retraining was I, I got all of the books that I could possibly find about any of yep. this. And that's all, I just listened to audiobooks all day long and mm -hmm. listened to podcasts all day long to just remind yeah. my brain over and over what was real. And so I think that this work is so important. Yeah, it is. Yeah. We, we're on our mission. So we'll keep this going. Awesome. Thank you. Nice seeing you. You as well. Right.